so thank you to those that have have presented already this morning. Um, it's amazing how things sometimes line up, even though you didn't talk through those things. Uh, Jen's little exhortation right before, right after her uh, welcome, I talking about God's worthiness, just the beauty of God, and that to be worshipped front and center on what we're doing today. Uh, Justin's incredible prayer, just absolutely beautiful. God is is big and wonderful in this gift of salvation. Uh, and then Karen, it, it's almost like we really planned this, and it wasn't me. It was, you know, the, the coinkydink thing, right? Everybody remember what a coinkydink is? Co, together, ink. God is writing his story through us together. Dink, no idea what that means, so just throw that out. <clears throat> But I do want you to know that I did, I did ask Karen to give an extended table devotional today, which you, which you might think would mean that there's going to be a shorter sermon. <laughs> Don't hold your breath, but we're going to try. But a couple of the things that Karen said, again, uncoached uh, in this area, and I'm summarizing, that we need to be careful not to drift into complacency of what I'm going to talk about. You're going to say, is that a coinkydink? I think so. And then she, as towards the end of, of her presentation, God never stops reaching out to us. Just hang on to that and see if you don't hear it again. Well, as I was putting, putting the uh, service together, the, the order of worship, uh, we weren't sure if we were going to have a bass this week, and so we had to carefully pick songs that we could kind of fudge our way through. Um, and then when when Scott did say that he was going to be able to, I thought, well, maybe I can change some of the songs. I got to looking at it, I thought, no, I don't want to. Because it goes so well with what the reading was all about. Dave, thank you. Really, really nice job, and I love the introductory challenge for us to remember this is written to us. This is a very plural thing. God is writing to us. The songs, the reading, all talk about some of the things that are in John that are just incredibly precious and incredibly important. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more in a second. I'm writing, making myself a note to come back to this. And I can't read my handwriting, so that probably won't happen. And I... I also tried something new with the order of worship, and so I want a thumbs up or thumbs down on this one. We started out with, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Not a typical church song, more of a kid's song. But I thought one of the things that I want to talk about or that I want to come out is the incredible joy of knowing that you're loved by God. And so I thought, what better way to, than to start out with that fun, crazy song? So did it work? Yay, nay? Is that good? Yeah? All right, we may, we may do some more of that. Uh, you know, if any group of people in the world should be happy and joyful, it really should be us, right? So we, we need to, uh, I say we, I'm looking in the mirror. I need to be more joy-f-u-l-l. -L. And so we're, we're going to incorporate some more of that into the order of worship. All right, to the sermon. We're talking about called all year long. And we're in a series of lessons right now on being called to Easter. What does that mean? How does that work? What is it that these scriptures that we're looking at over the couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks forward, what do, they, what do they emphasize about the cross and the empty tomb? What do they call us to when we see them in light of the cross and the empty tomb? Well, we started out for two weeks. We've been looking at Philippians, Philippians 1, chapter 1, and Philippians chapter 2. 
And in Philippians 1, Paul brilliantly, brilliantly calls the Philippian church that he loves very much, a very joy-filled church, by the way. He calls them to follow him without ever saying, follow me. Paul leads by example, and the example he's leading is as, remember, a slave of Christ. He calls himself a slave of Christ. Also remember, not the slavery of the United States back in the 1800s. More like, not exactly like, but more like, uh, oh, what's the name of that show? I can't ever remember it. Uh, Downton Abbey. More like the, the servants of Downton Abbey. But even a little more intense than that, because a slave, remember we talked about, is interested in several things. The main thing is complete and utter devotion to the master and complete and utter devotion to making the master's name look good, to carrying on the master's legacy, if you will, business, character, reputation. So it's a very integrated and a very powerful relationship. Now, this is, this is for slaves that are good and that, that are excelling. This is what they're shooting for. I'm sure there were some with bad attitudes. Those are not the ones we're talking about. Even to the point where slaves in the New Testament and the Old Testament could carry out business for their masters, that their signature carried the weight of their master's signature. They had access to the family seal so they could make binding contracts. That's a tremendous amount of power. And they did not take, that was not taken lightly. And last week we even talked about that there was, there was a passage in the Old Testament that on the year of freedom, when it was time for the slave to be released, that a slave, instead of going out and hiring himself out to another master, could go to his current master and say, I want to stay with you. And if the master agreed and wanted that slave to stay, then they would go to a doorpost and take basically an ice pick and all and pierce their ear. Now, I pointed at my earlobe. I don't remember if it was earlobe or where it was. Um, away from the brain, suffice it to say. And a slave that was marked in that way was known to be a valued slave that had chosen to stay with his master. And so there was a, a, an extra level of, I'm not sure if respect is the right word, but just stature. stature associated with that. I have chosen you, and you have chosen me, and I am in this for your cause. So it's, it's a, the idea of slavery in Scripture is much different, again, than what we experienced a couple of hundred years ago. Um, has it been a couple of hundred years? Over a hundred years ago, put it that way. Uh, and Paul starts the letter by saying, I'm a slave for Christ. I choose to be a slave for Christ, and he has chosen me. And in doing so, he's inviting all of us to see our life with Jesus that way. Now, you don't think of Paul as a slave because you know that he's beloved and he's a powerful teacher, and God used him in miraculous and wonderful ways. But Paul's saying, that's what being a slave for Jesus is like. You have the authority of the family name. You carry it forward. You, you carry it out. Then we looked at Philippians chapter 2. Also in Philippians 1, he talks about this partnership, this fellowship in the gospel, which is just a wonderful and beautiful phrase. In, in chapter 2, and he introduces the concept in chapter 1, carries it on in chapter 2, this idea of being like-minded. Being like-minded with each other, but that like-mindedness with each other is being like-minded with Jesus. And the beautiful Philippian hymn that's in uh, verses 6 through 11, I believe it is, starts out with that phrase, in your relationships with one another. Have the same mind as Jesus Christ. The Greek is kind of fuzzy, so it could say, have the same mind which is yours in Christ. Which one is it? Yes. Because as the scripture shows where Jesus emptied himself and lived this sacrificial love, which is the mind that we're supposed to have, that we love God's work so much, which is loving everyone, that we're willing to sacrifice our needs, our rights, our wants for each other. 
Jesus put it in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. By this, the whole world will know you are my disciples. You are true followers by the love you have for one another. Paul just quotes this Jesus song to make the same point. I want you to keep all of that in mind as we jump into John 3.16 today. And while we do that, we want to carry forward the questions that we began several weeks ago. Why did the author write this passage? This time it's the Apostle John writing this. Why did he write this to the church? What was he trying to teach the letter receivers, the, the gospel receivers, with this passage? What did he want them to know about God, about Jesus? What did he want them and us to know about the call that's being placed on our life? All right, John 3.16. Let, uh, let me read that. I'm going to read it in the Greek, not really. I actually have it in the Greek, so I could, but I wouldn't understand it, so I'm not going to put you through that either. For God so loved the world, we're all familiar with this, right, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now let me read a few more verses here. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed. He has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And this is the judgment. By the way, interesting word. The word for judgment there is crisis and can literally be translated as crisis. The crisis is the light has come into the world but the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible, you remember that this is in the, towards the end of a conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a rabbi, a very powerful Jewish man of, of great stature in the Jewish world. Where, where he led, others followed. Where he led, others followed. Um, speaking of Nicodemus. Anyway, I, I, I get ahead of myself. There's so much, so many directions to go with John 3.16. I could spend sermon after sermon after sermon just talking about the fact that believe is in here four times in these few verses. And then in John, the word for believe, pistuo, is always in the verb form. Pistuo is the verb form. Pistis is the noun form. It's always in the verb form. It could be translated faithing. Living faith could be trans translated trusting. And all those things that we talked about for an entire year about trust and the baggage that comes from the Jewish understanding of what trust is, that rock solid hope, that confidence that God is with you, that God will intervene, that God moves his kingdom and his power forward always and that God is greater than all things that surround, all things that try to knock us down, and all things that attack us. God is always greater and stronger and better. I could talk about the Greek around believe. And how it's very interesting. The ESV really gets it right when it says, Whoever does not believe is condemned because he has not believed. Where the NIV says, well, no, it says does not believe also. Never mind. There was, there's a translation that says something, uses other words than believe there. And it's like, why did you do that? It's the same Greek word. Anyway, so we're not going to talk about that. But I can spend a lot of time talking about pistuo, about that verb and how faith, even here in John, but faith throughout Scripture, that believing in Scripture is nothing if there's not a way of life associated with it. That you can say you believe in whatever you want to believe, but if there's no evidence in your life to back it up, you don't really believe it. That's what the reading was all about. The reading was that lesson. God is love. 
How do we know that, that we're okay with God? Because we love, because we live like Jesus. Over and over in that reading, it talks about the action portion of, of love. And so if we really believe that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, what's that calling us to? Doing the same thing, which is what Philippians 2 was calling us to. Living a sacrificial love in order to bless and honor the kingdom, the king, God Almighty. Well, I could also bring in, and I'll do this very quickly, that John chapter 1 is all about establishing the absolute divinity, stature, the eternal standing of Jesus Christ powerfully revealing the purpose of John's gospel early on. I've got a couple of scriptures for that too. And I don't know what I did with them. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Just right off the bat, opening of the gospel, he throws down the hammer. John wants us to know from the get-go who Jesus is. Jesus is big. Jesus is the big. Jesus is God Almighty involved in the creation without him that anything that has been created would not have been created because he was there and he was a part of that process. Jesus is God with feet. And then in verse 18, he says, no one has ever seen God. Remember in the Old Testament, if you saw the face of God, you would die. So even Moses veiled himself before he could see God. And on first meeting God, he turned his back. God told him to turn his back because if he saw him, he would die. So no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God. You see how he puts that together and continually emphasizes that who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. Such an interesting word there for closest relationship. I believe the ESV says, uh, by his side. I think that's what it says. I'm not sure exactly. The word that's used there is the same word that's, talk, that's used later in John's Gospel where it's the Last Supper, and it describes the disciple that Jesus loved was leaning on his bosom, the way that they reclined, and then John was leaning on him. Twilight and I went and visited, um, uh, went to pick up Coraline to spend the night a couple of weeks ago. And when we got there, uh, Chance was sitting on the couch, they were watching a movie, and he was laying back, and both of the kids, one side, one was on one side and one on the other, and they both had their heads down on his chest. That's the word. That's the word that's, that's here. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is so close to God that he rests his head on the God the Father's chest. He has made him known. That's the thesis statement for John. Everything that came before that and everything that comes after that is all about making God known to us so that we can live a life that we are confident and sitting with God and leaning our head upon his chest. I could talk about that all day long. But I want to take this sermon in a little bit different direction, and I hope it works. I'm going to try and do this pretty quickly. John 3.16, Jesus proclaims that God loves the world so much he gave his only begotten son. Now, on this side of the cross, we read that with, this, with the cross in mind. Some Bible translations have these, this in red letters, that this is the part of the, continu of the continuing conversation with Nicodemus, this incredibly smart, learned man who is himself a teacher. The NIV doesn't. It's in black letters, which was very curious to me because I always thought it was Jesus talking. Read several what I'm going to call highbrow commentaries. And they all agree with the NIV, which is shocking. Many scholars believe this is John, the Holy Spirit's comments 
on the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. It's almost like this is the lesson. Here's the moral of the story. And so what we have to do is remember who Nicodemus is and ask why this was written and does it have the cross in mind? Now, the other side of the story is, even if this was Jesus' continuing conversation, was Jesus, is Jesus brilliant enough to have spoken these words which have layered meanings? Well, yeah. So really, whether it's part of the conversation with Nicodemus or whether it's the Spirit through John's comments on the conversation with Nicodemus, the idea of the cross being in mind is absolutely true. And it makes me kind of wonder if Nicodemus, when Jesus was put on the cross, and then when the tomb was empty, if he didn't flash back to this and go, oh, that's what he meant when he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It wasn't just to walk among us. It was also to pay the price for us. Now, as a good Jew, especially a good Jewish scholar would do, he would say something in Hebrew like, whoa. Okay. So how does this conversation, how does this lesson intersect with our questions about Easter? In light of the empty tomb, in light of the cross, what is this calling us to do, to be? Well, it's all there in 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. He's reminding us that God loves all people so much that he gave, that he made the way home. God could choose, could have chosen to destroy, to judge at any moment. Instead, he chose to reach out and to give of himself the most precious thing of himself. That son who he loved so much that they rested together and he asked them to go and suffer and pay the price so that others could do that level of intimacy with God. God is the one that came to search us out. God is the one who came and paid the price. That's the way of God's Easter love. It's not to judge. He doesn't want to judge. He doesn't want to pick and choose. He wants to make available his life, his goodness, his kindness, his beauty for everyone. And the other lesson in there somewhere is that God will forgive whomever God chooses to forgive. God will value whomever he chooses to value. And the answer is the whole world. And we're called to follow in those footsteps. Remember, I truly believe, but it works either way, that this is the Spirit's lesson for us to learn. But it was something that he used the character of Nicodemus either to address directly or for us to put together with Nicodemus being a part of the conversation that led to the lesson. That this is something Nicodemus needed to know, this well-educated teacher, this leader, this rabbi, this man with incredible authority and respect in the Jewish world. He needed to learn something. So Nicodemus, Nicodemus is being reminded, and we're being reminded, the greatest rabbi has a lesson for the hungry rabbi. The greatest teacher has a lesson for the hungry learner. That God's love, God's passion is for all the world, even for those who have turned away. That's why I read past John 3.16. His love extends to those who have traded the light for the darkness. God doesn't cut them off and throw them away. But he continues to pursue them. He continues to love them. And if this was part of the conversation with Jesus, I'm switching back and forth to whichever way makes better sense with the point I'm making. If this was part of that conversation with Jonah, I wonder if Jonah thought about Jonah. Nicodemus 
I wonder if Nicodemus thought about Jonah and the Ninevites. Because that would fit, wouldn't it? The Ninevites were horrible. Enemies of Israel had done horrible, incredibly terrible things that, that if it was on a YouTube video, you would begin throwing up before you had the chance to turn it off. The way that they tortured and killed and mistreated. And yet God sent his prophet to seek their repentance before he destroyed them. But you see, I've never thought of 316 in this way. I've always thought of 316 kind of in a, a feel-good way, right? Team Tebow, Tim Tebow had John 316 on his eyes all the time, which I thought was cool. Used to see it in the stadiums. I remember going to Houston Little football games, and some, there was always one or two or three people with a big poster that said John 316. So I really do think that this feel-good way is okay, and it kind of reminds me of the prodigal son. And remember, in the prodigal son, he metaphorically spits in the father's face, wastes his inheritance, and when he finally hits rock bottom, he realizes that even his father's slaves have it better than he does. Than he does. The one who had all the money, had all the fun, and was living life by his own terms, and figuring life out by his own brains, when it was all said and done, he finally realized, this is garbage. Left to my own devices, I'm left with only garbage. Maybe, maybe dad will take me back as a slave. He's taken a huge chance because he knew, he knew that he did not deserve to step foot in his father's household, on his father's property. He had removed himself. It wasn't that the father had cut him off and said, you're no longer my son. By his actions and, the, and, and how he treated his father, he was saying, you are no longer my father. So he knew that being a son was out of the question, and it was really more than he could ask to be made a slave, but he had no other choice. He realized the mess he'd made, the insults he had spewed, the shame he had brought to his father. So yes, being a son was out of the question. But perhaps, perhaps in his father's great capacity for mercy, he would take him as one of his slaves. And that, being a slave, he knew was far better than living life on his own terms. And then the miracle happened. The father, being representative of God and God's love, full of mercy, God's chesed, sees his son a long way off, gets up and runs to his son, throws his arms around him, kisses him, welcomes him home with a celebration fit for a king and restores his family authority upon him. Can you find John 3.16 in that? The incredible story of God's forgiveness, his passionate desire to welcome us home. Remember the audience? Before the story of the prodigal son, Luke is very careful to tell us who the audience is. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathered to hear Jesus. You hear that? The tax collectors and sinners, the yuckiest of the yucky as far as Jews were concerned. We're all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the holier than thou's, that would be those of us in this room, muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. We tend to see John 3.16 in the tax collectors and the sinners, and they are part of God's beautiful, life-giving love for sure. But the lesson of John 3.16 is also found, and maybe even mainly found, in the character that shows up next, the elder brother. The one who had faithfully served his father even when his little brother launched. And you know that meant his chore list expanded. 
He had not insulted the father's name. He had served him well. But you remember, he did say to his father in his anger that the father was throwing this party, that he had slaved away under his father's name. He had forgotten the beauty of amazing grace. He had forgotten the wonder of serving the Father, even as a slave, that it is good life, full life, and that being the Father's son changes slaving into grateful serving. Serving your king, serving the one you love the most, gratefully serving the one who has blessed you and set you free. Serving the one who has given you status and purpose and value. Making you worthy of a king's ransom. I think that's where the prodigal son and John 3.16 intersect. Praise team, if you'll go ahead and come on up. So I think what Easter calls us to in these verses is to remember. Is to remember and furiously hang on to, and I pick that word very specifically, to furiously hang on to that rather than anger and selfishness and pride. To remember and to furiously hang on to God's love is for everyone. God passionately reaches out, continuously passionately reaches out to the whole world through the cross and the empty tomb, yes, and through those of us who have been rescued by that incredible act of selfish, sacrificial love, which we are called to imitate. We are the evidence of God's believing in us yes. to the world. Yes. We're called to remember the great joy and the freedom and the life that comes with dwelling in the overwhelming love of God. And to hold on tight to it and not let the devil or the world or cynicism or whatever it is diminish or take away the wonder and gratitude that comes from, and I jump over to Philippians 2, the incredible encouragement we have from being united with Christ, the truly restful comfort from His love, the heart-filling common sharing in the Spirit, the soul-satisfying tenderness and compassion that showers over us when we trust in Jesus and rest against his chest, the partnership that Jesus has brought us to, and the joy of remembering how much God loves us all. Now, ain't that joy full? I think the only thing we can do is sing. So let's sing.